traditional super fun and all about artisan cheese and more to melt your peaceful heart and toast your peaceful life. Coming to you from the Appalachian Mountains of southwestern Virginia, this is the Peaceful Heart Farmcast. Hey, this is Scott Hall from Peaceful Heart Farm, and you are listening to the Peaceful Heart Farmcast. Hello, everybody. Melanie Hall here. I hope you are doing very, very well. The conversation today and every day revolves around the value of tradition, traditional homestead living, traditional raw milk products, and artisan cheese. Topics discussed here are designed to create new perspectives and possibilities for how you might add the taste of tradition to your life. It's spring in Virginia, and we have calves, lambs, a goat kid, and baby quail. So much is going on. Um, This is true of every spring. After sleepy winter, spring brings rapid growth and renewed life. It's just bursting out everywhere. Um, I want to take a minute, say welcome, hello to all you new listeners. Welcome back to my veteran homestead loving regulars. I love you so much. Thank you for stopping by the farm cast for each and every episode. Um, I'm so excited now to share with you what's going on at the farm this week. We love our place here. Uh, The dream started nearly 17 years ago and just keeps growing toward our ever-changing vision. Let me talk about the sheep. The lambing has begun. Just yesterday, Cinco de Mayo, 5th of May, we had a brand new baby ram lamb born. He is strong and healthy, weighing in at 6 pounds, 6 ounces. His mom is the youngest ewe out there. She's just now one year old. And there are six more ewes still to deliver. A couple of them look like they're about to burst. They're as wide as they are tall, just about. And here's an interesting thing. Sheep usually have a single in their first year and twins in their second year and and onward. And we've had quite a few along our journey that have even had triplets on a regular basis. We have one still that has triplets on a regular basis. And on very rare occasions, I think maybe once we've had one that had quadruplets. Um, I have to say that four lambs is a lot to keep up with out there. So I'm glad that we don't really have a lot of that. Um, A lot of sheep breeders will actually breed for those triplets and quadruplets because they want to have as many lambs as they can possibly have. But you end up bottle feeding a lot of time when you get to triplets and, and quadruplets. And the sheep are no longer right outside my living room window. We ran out of grass in that pasture. So I'm making a bit of a longer trek to check on them a couple times a day. Concern for their health and the health of the pasture drove that decision. You know, sure, it was much more convenient for me to be able to look out the window and easily check on them. But their health and the pasture health is much more important than my convenience. If the grass gets too short... It has trouble growing back, especially if we've had any kind of drought. We learned that lesson quite a few years back. And good pasture management is essential for our grass-based operation. I'm sure you've seen cows grazing a lot of times out there, and you wonder if there's any grass for them to eat at all. There's this like slight green carpet, but there's no real grass growing there. So we don't want that. Um, And the health of the sheep is greatly impacted by short grass as well. <clears throat> domesticated sheep and goats around the world have issues with parasitic worms. And we've worked long and hard on our flock to alleviate this issue. Uh, we lost a lot of lambs in the beginning. We even lost a couple of ewes to these to these parasites. We were trying to go too natural. And um, the long and short of it is that, that the worms are pooped out onto the grass And in the warmth and wet of spring, especially, it's the perfect medium for them to reinfect their host sheep because they crawl up the grass and they get eaten by the sheep. And so if the grass is really, really short, the sheep are actually eating the grass and it has the uh, parasites on it again, which they will eat and then it lays eggs inside of them and they poop them out and the cycle kind of continues. But... They can only crawl so high up on the grass, and then the dryness will kill them. They, they need moisture. So the solution to this deadly issue is regular pasture rotation. You want uh, just about the time that the eggs would hatch, the sheep get moved to another clean section of grass. 
and then the worms are left behind and most of them die off without a host in which to lay their eggs and so if some do hatch to begin to crawl up the grass as long as the grass is tall enough the worms are left behind having only climbed a short way up the grass stem and the and the sheep are eating a little bit higher up on the grass in the beginning we were actually forced to use chemical warming solutions regularly it's done in normal operations it's done four times a year just to keep our our livestock alive um, now we rarely need to worm them we still keep an eye on them and we worm them as needed every once in a while one or two or so are going to pick up a big worm load and uh, so we have to take care of that uh, so far this year we checked them a month or so ago no worming was even needed um and the goats, too, have not had to have any warmer. They looked great as well. Now, speaking of goats, <laughs> have I mentioned that it is almost impossible to keep goats inside a fence? Now, Scott put lots of effort into creating a fencing system that would hold them. And I must say that the perimeter fence does a pretty good job. But inside the perimeter, they pretty much go wherever they want. We have 14 separate paddocks that we use to rotate stock so they're not too long on one part of the pasture for reasons I just stated. So four of these paddocks are in the front part of the property. We have four in the front. <clears throat> so you have the perimeter fence and then there's four sections within that perimeter fence in the front. And then there are five in what I would call the midpoint of our land. And in the back field, there are five more. Now, the front, the middle, and the back are each separated by a driveway. There's a driveway between the front and the middle and between the middle and the back. And the goats don't generally go across that divide. So there's actually a perimeter fence around each of those sections. But within the middle and the back sections, the front, they're okay. But in the middle and the back, they pretty much move at will between the five paddocks pretty much the sheep the donkeys the cows they stay where we put them but not the goats now as i said they generally stay inside the perimeter and only go between the internal paddock fences but there is this one goat she goes in and out of any fence anywhere anytime this is a full-grown goat and somehow she goes right through the fence these are like six inches high and 12 inches wide i think are the sections of the the gate the holes between the wires in the gates or sorry in the fence you know she's just like houdini and why is that important because she we just let her go in and out you know we don't even try to keep her caught up she just goes wherever she wants well it's important because we decided not to breed our goats anymore gradually the cashmere goats that we have will be phased out and we're going to replace them with a meat goat breed because we're, we're probably always going to keep goats for pasture maintenance. They eat a lot of stuff that the sheep and the cows don't, especially woody brush things and briars and um, wild roses and the blackberries that can get crazy. So they keep all that stuff kind of cleaned up. And originally, I wanted the cashmere goats because I had dreams of using cashmere yarn for my knitting projects. I think I mentioned this in the last podcast about the cashmere when you start out on a homestead you want to do everything then reality sets in and you, and you realize you have to scale back there's only so much time in the day you simply can't do it all and so it is with the cashmere i simply do not have the time to keep up with the cashmere much less get it processed and spun into yarn i mean i have knitting projects in progress at this time that i've been working on for over a year okay back to houdini goat about a week ago, I was bring out. I was bringing in the cows from the field for their morning milking, and lo and behold, there was a goat kid out there. It didn't take me long to figure out how that happened. Houdini went to visit the boys at some point. As I said, she goes wherever she wants, whenever she wants. She had a really cute kid, and I'm happy to have him. There's a part of me that wants to hurry up the switcheroo so we can have goat kids again. But I'll stick with the plan. It will be a couple more years before we switch over to the meat goats. And this will likely be the last kid born here on the homestead until that switch is completed. Now on to the cows. The cows are doing great. We're still waiting on a calf or two to be born. Um, 
and uh, Wendell and Luna, they're doing really great. They moved over with the sheep, and we put two donkeys in with, with the sheep also. They are our livestock guardian animals, so they'll keep any coyotes away from those uh, lambs as they're being born. So they're all over there together. But I, I actually had to call the vet about Cloud, which I'll get to in just a minute. But while I had the vet on the phone talking with her about Cloud, I was asking about Buttercup to get some advice about what to look for if she were to have another problem like she had a couple of years ago with her calf. Uh, she had a stillborn calf. And uh, so according to the vet, we're still in good shape, and I know what to look for in regards to identify uh, if she's having an issue. And there's really not much you can do. I mean, if the calf is stillborn, it's stillborn, you know. But um, I would just want to catch it a little bit more earlier than we did last time. And induce, I think maybe we can induce labor on her if we need to. But but actually right now, according to the vet, she's, you know, everything that I've looked at, she's she's doing okay. Now, Cloud is having a problem, which is why I called the vet in the first place, and uh, we've not been able to resolve it. She has overgrown hooves on both rear feet. Just one, to, you know, they have that cloven hoof, and one of them is just wrapped over top of the other one. And it is quite significant, and it it may be causing her some pain. It looks like it's causing her some pain. It is definitely making her very sensitive and jumpy when we get near her rear legs. Scott has gotten kicked quite a few times, and she is quick with that foot. I think I talked about the kick that injured the thumb on his right hand. He's had to slow down on some of the construction because he can't grip with that injured hand. It's getting better, but still has a way to go before he has full function with that hand. So we're still looking for a solution to that. There's a very special piece of equipment that is required in order to be able to trim hooves on a cow. They're not normally trimmed, uh, except in situations like this. Uh, so the vet's going to have to call us back on that one. But Violet and Claire are cruising right along. They've both had their calves and... Uh, I'm still unsure whether Butter is actually going to have a calf. She doesn't really look preggers to me. Scott says yes. We shall see over the next month or so if there's any indication that she's ready to deliver us a beautiful calf. Now the quail. We are raising quail for meat birds. Uh, ants eggs as well. But at this point, right now we have 33 baby quail in, the, in brooders. Um, that's like an intermediate place between the incubator and living outside. Once they're hatched out, they live in a brooder for two to three weeks. We use these large plastic storage containers, and there's a piece of woven wire that's inserted into the lid so that, you know, it's open to the daylight. And on top of that is a heat lamp. They have deep bedding of wood shavings. And that keeps them warm and safe while they grow their permanent feathers. In an unbelievably short while, like I said, two weeks or two to three weeks, they will be completely feathered out. And we're actually re uh, nearing that date at this point. And once they're fully feathered, we gradually remove the heat lamp and then transfer them to the cages outside. And at eight weeks of age, they are fully grown. It's very quick. And today, I will start collecting eggs for the next batch to go into the incubator, so on Wednesday next week, I'll have however many eggs we get. We're getting 10 to 13 eggs per day. That means likely over 70 eggs will get into the incubator this time. So that'll be pretty exciting. Now, the garden is an interesting work that we have going on. Uh, Scott worked very hard on getting that garden ready for planting. Um, and I've been very busy with so many things. It's a little too late for peas. It will get hot before they actually... Uh, can finish their cycle. They hate heat. They, they just die right out when the, when the heat comes on. But I have lots and lots of beans and tomatoes and onions and uh, peppers and culinary herbs that are ready to go out there in the garden. But it needs to be a little bit warmer. We're actually going to have some temperatures down into the uh, mid to upper 30s. I think maybe even tonight, tomorrow night, sometime really soon anyway. So I'm going to wait a little bit longer uh, before I start putting out all of the beans and definitely before those uh, tomatoes and peppers go out there. 
So I'll be getting into that over the next week or two. And I love planting the garden. I watch the plants come up from the seeds and they're sprouting and they grow rapidly and they're reaching towards the sun and just leafy green. It's just lovely. And this year I expect to have to weed much less. Scott spent a good bit of time putting down a landscaping ground cover and then he cut holes in it every so often uh, we do square foot gardening and so we put holes in it uh, for where the seeds will go or plants and the the tomatoes and the peppers are actually plants that I'm growing in the house right now that'll be put into those holes. I'm excited to see how this works for us this year. Weeds are always a problem and the least fun part of gardening. A few weeds are kind of fun to work with but an overgrowth is just really hard work and it and it just takes your plants down so much. Anyway with so many other things to do it's easy for those weeds to get ahead of me. Our garden is quite large and it's the perfect setting to allow those weeds to grow faster than I can keep them under control. So I have my fingers crossed that this year the landscape cover is going to do the trick in keeping those weeds to a minimum. Now let me talk about the creamery. The first room in the creamery is nearing completion. Well, near completion. It's nearing a near completion. The tile floors will have to be installed later. And the electrical connection is going to be temporary. But it will be functional enough for, for me to use it to store and age cheese. We have right now a freezer that is set up with a, uh, it's a special temperature control that keeps the temperature right around 55 degrees plus or minus uh, 3 or 4 degrees. That is our current aging environment. Uh, and we are talking some very, very limited space there with no control of the hum humidity. And humidity is, control is important for aging cheese. The new aging room is going to be an incredible asset for me. It's, it's very spacious. I'll be able to put in a humidifier to keep the cheese from drying and cracking. I, I'm just so excited about the prospects of making more cheese and aging it more effectively. Now, as I talk about cheese making, I, I really have such a great time making cheese. And I don't know if I've said this before, but making cheese is a very peaceful endeavor. I have a couple of podcasts on basic cheese making and the process involved. But um, in a nutshell, the milk gets heated, cultures are added, then a coagulant makes one big curd, and then you cut the curds up into small pieces. And from there, there's several different branches that can happen that I'm not going to describe here. I'll do that again another time. But once the curd is cooked, I say cooked, but it, it never really gets above 100 up to 122 degrees for uh, the alpine cheeses. But it just depends on the, the cheese. Once the curd is deemed done, the whey gets drained and the curds are put into cheese molds or forms. And it's a long day. It's a very long day, but a wonderful experience. I can take my mind off of anything that may be bothering me and using the cheese making almost like a meditation. Hey, anyone interested in cheese making classes? We can start with something really easy. Drop me an email. Melanie at PeacefulHeartFarm.com Melanie at PeacefulHeartFarm.com Let me know your thoughts on that. Now the last thing that I'm going to talk about is the herd chairs. I've opened up a larger number of herd chairs at this point. Lots and lots of folks are looking for raw milk and raw milk products. Um, this is one of my favorite parts of what we are doing with our homestead right now. I get to know my herd chair owners a little bit more every week. It's just, I have the same customers each and every week, and it's just such a wonderful experience to get to know these guys. There are some really great people that are doing great things. And I hope to attract some attention from Winston-Salem, North Carolina. If you know anyone in that area looking for raw milk, let them know about us. Uh, they'll need to come to the farm to pick up as we are in Virginia and can't deliver across state lines. But uh, we can certainly set them up. We drive into Winston-Salem quite a bit. It's um, an hour or so to get all the way to downtown for us. But if you're on the north side, it's pretty easy to get here. We'll give you a tour and the kids will love petting the donkeys. 
Well, that's it for today's podcast. I hope you enjoyed walking along with me as we toured the homestead and all of our animals and what's going on. Maybe later this summer, we can invite you to a physical tour. Those lambs are going to be cute over the next few months. If you enjoyed this podcast, please hop over to Apple Podcasts and subscribe. Give me a five-star rating and a review. It just helps so much to, for the logarithm, the algorithm, logarithm, algorithm, to be for it to show up in searches for people who are looking for this kind of content. Also, please share it with any friends or family who might be interested in this type of content. And thank you so much for stopping by the homestead. And until next time, may God fill your life with grace and peace. <music>